All right, welcome everyone to this session of the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. Um, I appreciate everyone's patience as we're dealing with a little bit of technical issues and are starting a few minutes late. Um, so we are going to be um, discussing H649 and an act relating to the Vermont Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. And before I have um, legislative council um, start to tee things up for us and give us a little bit of background on open meeting law and the open meeting sections that I think we're going to focus on today. I did want to say that our focus here in government operations is going to be on not the work that was done last biennium on setting up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but rather how we are going to deal with some of the issues, both with uh, the procedures for how the commission is going to do its work and also this issue of filling a vacancy and i know i've already received some communication i'm sure other folks on the committee have um, where folks would like us to you know consider changing the commission and thinking about its scope of work um i think that those are valid conversations and we should be having them but that is not the work that the government operations committee is going to be focused on so just wanted to frame that up uh, for all of us and the folks back home that we have a couple of procedural and technical issues that are really the focus of this particular bill. And with that, uh, I'd like to invite Mr. Anderson to give us a little reminder, a refresher on open meeting law. So thanks for making it. Tucker. Good afternoon to the record, Tucker Anderson, Legislative Council. Wonderful to be back and to zoom out from the granular world of municipal charters and the, the broader world of a little bit of an overview and refresher for all of you. Uh, so we touched upon this at the beginning of last session, gave a little bit of a primer on the open meeting law and how it applies to the public bodies of the state. So the quick reminder version here is that all public bodies, that means multi-member bodies that make consensus decisions, you might think of them as commissions or committees, task forces, things like that, uh, are subject to the open meeting law requirements of 1 VSA section 310 through 314. Um, any gathering of a quorum or more of members of that public body re requires compliance with the open meeting law and the procedures for meetings in the state. <clears throat> so what is a quorum? By default, it is a majority of the members of that public body. So whenever you have a majority of the members of a public body gathering to discuss the business of the public body, you have a meeting that is subject to the open meeting law. If this hasn't already started to tee up a little bit of a sensation of what the problem is here today, um, well, here's the spoiler for my fellow sci-fi nerds. This is a three-body problem. In statute, when you create a public body that has three members, it is impossible for the members of that public body to have any discussion of their business without meeting legally under the open meeting law. So this has happened quite a few times in the past where public bodies are stuck in cones of silence because any communication concerning the business of their public body would trigger open meeting law requirements. Warnings, posting agendas, holding the meeting, recording minutes, and that is for any deliberative discussion of their work. Uh, the most recent example, besides this one, would be uh, the tax commission that was formed two biennia ago and that could only have conversations about their work in warned meetings that were held in this room. Representative Chase. Clarification, the, is the quorum of um, the total number of people that's supposed to be included or the, does it include vacancies? Like if you had a 10 person body and five vacancies, would a quorum be five people or would a quorum be three people? It would be the quorum of the public body as it's established in statute. So it would be a quorum of 10. Regardless of vacancies. Correct. Thank you. All right. This is key to not just this particular commission, but 
many of our uh, boards and commissions uh, and other bodies that this uh, that we set up. So I just want everybody to kind of know that this is not unique to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Representative Cooper, did you have a question? Uh, trying to decide, actually. No, not yet. I will. Let's quickly touch upon the concept of the business of a public body. It's not necessarily implicated beyond what we've already discussed with the free body problem. Um, Any time in statute that you're assigning a duty to one of these public bodies, it will immediately trigger a meeting requirement for deliberations about that duty. So something to keep in mind in the future when you're determining whether to give a duty to a specific officer of government or to that consensus public body. If you give duty and authority to the body instead of a particular officer, you're going to trigger meeting requirements anytime that function is carried out. Something that articulated in this room in the past about some of the decisions and other bills that you'll be making. Okay, so moving on to some other issues in the open meeting law that you're very familiar with. Quickly remind you the work that you've done around electronic meetings. Uh, by default, under the open meeting law in 1 VSA section 312A2, electronic meetings are permitted currently, uh, so long as there is a designated physical location where a member of the public body or staff is present and that complies with Vermont's public accommodation laws. That is suspended until July 1st, 2024 based on the temporary authority that you passed last year and that you also passed in three preceding sessions as well. Any questions on electronic meetings? You are all very familiar with this by now. Yes. Um, and we will be revisiting these, I think, uh, that the Senate has taken the first crack at a more current solution of that in, in a bill that we'll receive later this session. In 2022, the General Assembly uh, enacted a bill that codified a new 1 VSA Section 312A that provides that that temporary authority that you've put in all those bills will automatically be triggered whenever there is a uh, declared state of emergency. Um, all right, I think that's most of the concepts that you need. The only other one that I would touch upon would be executive sessions, 1 VSA section 313. Executive sessions are allowed upon motion and then vote of the public body to enter what is informally known as a closed session where the public may be excluded and where the public body may deliberate on a specific issue contained in the motion that meets the criteria, one of the criteria, uh, under 1 VSA 313A. There's an enumerated list of the bases for the motion that you're allowed to have a closed meeting. Um, that's all. Uh, I think I already mentioned this, but there's no constitutional requirement broadly for open meetings. There's really only one constitutional requirement as far as that's concerned, and it's the open doors provision of the constitution that governs the state house that the doors have to be open when the General Assembly is in session, unless there's essentially a public safety or public health concern that would require them to be shut. But as far as the state and its political subdivisions and all of those wonderful public bodies, it is all a creature of statute. Don't feel the power <laughs> broadly. All right, thank you very much, Tucker, for thank you all for teeing up those broad concepts for us. Like Amy in the swap seat, so you welcome back. Thank you. Thankfully, Tucker is not going far. <laughs> um, so, for the record, Damian Leonard, Office of Legislative Counsel. So, uh, because we've got Tucker here today, I want to take advantage of his time. And so, I want to, instead of walking through the full bill, start with section eight. Uh, and look at sections eight, nine, and 10. And then if we have time, I'll go back and do the other sections today. And otherwise we can do them the next time I'm in. So 
Section eight is amending existing law for the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The first change is on the bottom of page eight. Uh, and we're really just adding in a cross reference here uh, that I'd left out before. Um, so it's saying, notwithstanding any provision of chapter five, subchapter two of this title, which is the open meeting law, or section 911 of this chapter, to the contrary, uh, the commission shall permit any individual that they interview to elect to have the interview held in private. So basically, if you're being interviewed by the commission about your experience of discrimination, you can elect to have a private meeting with them so that your name and the video recording are not public forever. Uh, and that's something that was in the existing law. We've added in this notwithstanding language to clarify uh, that it's not just standing the open meeting law. <clears throat> so the existing law, Damien, just contradicts or is a deviation from the open meeting it, law. It is. And we're just adding the reference and making it clear that we're not withstanding. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So it's, this is already the existing law in here. Um, and so we're just we're just clarifying that yes, this is a deviation, and we intend to deviate from the open meeting law here. So uh, section nine adds a brand new section um, entitled "Commission Meetings, Alternative Procedures, and Exceptions to the Open Meeting Law." So, notwithstanding uh, the open meeting law, uh, it first. Uh, and we're on page nine here for those of you who are following along. First, it permits a quorum or more of the commissioners to attend a regular special or emergency meeting by electronic or other means uh, without being physically present at the designated meeting location. Uh, so this allows the commissioners to attend virtually uh, and the quorum requirements are not affected because they can have a quorum of virtual people at a meeting. Um, second, uh, it allows, uh, provides that the commission is not required to designate a physical meeting space, so they could have a virtual meeting, uh, with the public here where they just set up a virtual meeting space. Uh, and then third, uh, the members and staff of the public body are not required to be physically present at a designated meeting location. Um, and so, again, this allows them uh, to have meetings remotely uh, and to have meetings with people who are around the state. Uh, so you could have people attending from the Northeast Kingdom, um, from Brattleboro, Bennington, uh, and they can all meet virtually here. Um, so. B provides uh, certain requirements for when the commission does meet electronically um, in order to ensure that there's public access. Uh, those requirements are listed at the top of page 10. The first is they have to use some sort of technology that permits the public to attend through electronic or other means. Uh, the second is they have to allow the public to access the meeting by telephone. The third is they have to video record and live stream the meeting. And the fourth is that they have to post the information that would enable the public to access the meeting uh, and include that information on the published agenda. So just like we do for our meetings here, um, they're using technology that allows electronic attendance. They're allowing the public to call in. They're video recording and live streaming. Um, and they're posting the information on the agenda so people know where to go. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Damien, posting any place physically or not? Uh, Tucker? <laughs> Sorry. It depends on what the public body is. Municipal public bodies are required to be able to meeting law to post at the town clerk's office and in two designated physical locations. Under the suspension temporary authority concerning the open meeting law, it's allowed to be virtual locations. That's not included here. So, because they're not a municipal public body, they're a state public body. So, they don't have to have, they a, do physical. Not have, to have a physical location. Thank you. 
Thank you, Tucker. And just for framing, okay. is this largely the same as the temporary authority that we did in Act One last year, or are there key deviations? It seems at first glance like this authorization for the mission is really modeled on what we did in Act One. Is that there's one addition here, and that's the requirement to video record and live stream. Which is currently not expected as a temporary solution. So this verbatim what the temporary authority is, except there's the additional duty to have the video recorded in live stream. And as it's structured here, the, this would just run, this authority would run contemporaneous with the authority of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So this is basically saying, even if that temporary authority from Act One goes away, this is the, these are the rules for the commission. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? Okay. Um, so subsection C just below that, uh, defines closed meeting as a meeting of the commission that's live streamed and video recorded, but that is otherwise closed for purposes of physical or digital access and participation of the public. So, in other words, uh, there's a live stream of what's happening, there's a recording of what's happening, but members of the public can't just jump into the conversation. Um, similar to what we've done uh, with some of the hearings here, where uh, you have to have an invitation to actually join the Zoom call that's participating in the meeting, but anyone from the public can watch the live stream on YouTube. Um, they just can't join into the conversation in the room. Uh, <clears throat> and then C2 uh, is another particular piece for the commission here. Uh, and I, I defer to Tucker regarding whether we've used this language before. Um, but what this will do is upon a finding by the commission that there are material threats to the health or safety of the commission, its staff, witnesses, or invitees, the commission may hold a closed meeting. Uh, so in other words, a meeting where there's no physical or digital access for the public. Uh, and the commission may allow its staff, counsel, and any persons who are subject of the discussion or whose information is needed to access the closed meeting. So in other words, they can have an access controlled meeting uh, if there are threats to the health and safety of either the commission and staff or the people participating in the meeting. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yes, sorry, Representative Chase. I had scanning the room, but so um, is that an only situation? Like the rest of the time, if they're doing a digital meeting, anybody has to have access to the Zoom? So, uh, the yep. So for the other digital meeting, they have to permit attendance to the public. They have to allow public access by telephone, um, similar to what you would do with an open public meeting um, at the municipal level. Where I assume there's a public question and answer session. If I'm familiar with the meetings from my own municipality here, um, so I I apologize. This is really Tucker's. Tucker's wheelhouse, and it's an area where I go to, you know, only the occasional uh, select board, or I guess city council here in Montpelier um, meeting. So I'm not very familiar with it. Um, anyway, uh, and then, so does that answer your question before I move on? So it's, it's, Essentially, they can close the meeting if there's a health or safety threat, um, or they can have a virtual meeting if there is no health or safety threat that's open to the public. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, anecdotally, would that include uh, the possibility of somebody jumping on um, from out of state with, uh, let's say, unkind intent? Um, like we saw at the beginning of some of the Zooms. Uh, but we yeah. Here. Yes, it, it it would have the potential for someone to jump on the call and Zoom bomb. Well, uh, would that include, uh, be included in the uh, finding that there are material threats to health or safety 
um, would that be a reason to have a closed meeting? Or would that in occurrence have to happen first? And then I, I think the commission has to make the finding uh, first. The let's see. Um, Yeah, so I, I think the commission has to make the finding first in order to hold a closed meeting. Stay to find. Yes. That. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to double check to make sure that there wasn't uh, something that allowed them to close the meeting in process. Representative Higley has a question if we've solved, if we've resolved that. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize for showing up late. Uh, looks like I had to uh, reintroduce my Zoom. I haven't used it in a while, so here I am. But um, this is kind of a follow up on Representative Chase's question. Um, what are there specific instances that would uh, warrant a health or a safety threat? Who determines who determines that? Is there is there situations out there in other instances that warrant uh, what a health and safety threat would be? So the the bill would provide that the the finding <laughs> the commission determines that there's a material threat. Um, I don't know if we have uh, any existing case law or guidance on how to make that determination. Um, but I think that the commissioners can speak a little bit to uh, why the commission asked that this language be included. Uh, um, at, at some point. I just wanted to, while we're on this, um, just return and really underscore what the definition of closed is. This is not an executive session, right? We're talking about it being closed to people joining, for instance, Zoom, but it's still being live streamed. People are, can still be. Yeah, exactly. So if you think of this, so imagine this meeting, if members of the public couldn't just walk through that door. Right now, this is essentially a closed meeting electronically because it's just people who have the secure link that's been set out for the Zoom. And so a general member of the public can't do like what happened at the beginning of COVID where anyone could just sign on to the Zoom meeting. Uh, and so, in this case, this is a closed meeting if the, if the public can just walk through that door. Um, and that's different from an executive session where an executive session, no one from the public can view what's happening in the executive session. So, and this is actually, um, the, uh, it actually, if you get down to C3, it specifically addresses that the commission shall not be required to live stream or video record any portion of a closed meeting held in executive session. So it sort of distinguishes the two. So think of open meeting as anyone can come in off the street or from the um, from wherever they are in the world if they if they're coming in electronically and join the meeting. Closed meeting, it's just invited participants. <laughs> Executive session, public can't view it at all. And in order to, and I'll give you representations, in order to go into executive session, though, on record, make a finding that there's a cause for them to go into executive exactly. session, just like any other public body. Yep. Okay. And if, if <laughs> person, they could have a closed Zoom, but because there's a fiscal location that's open. Have a closed meeting. That's right. Like right. the public can attend. Right. So, right. so you, the the key is open open meeting. And Tucker, correct me if I get off track here. Open meeting. There has to be a means for the public to attend the meeting and to join the meeting. Closed meeting. Public can view it, but they can't join the meeting. And then executive session is not available for public viewing. It's for a specific purpose, and there is a vote, a motion on the record that's voted on to go into executive session. You discuss what you moved uh, the executive session for. When that discussion 
discussion is finished, you come back into regular session and the public can again view. Um, so you, uh, some of you have probably experienced this where you'll go into executive session for anywhere from a couple minutes to an hour to discuss a topic. And then you come back and the public is again available. Sometimes there's a decision made that's announced or something like that, or you just move on to the next thing on the meeting agenda. I just want to make a, an analogy, and I don't know if this is right, Tucker, but a closed meeting to me sounds a little bit like being on a webinar. You're invited with a specific link, but you don't have dialogue with the folks on who are presenting on that webinar, um, but you're allowed to watch everything that's happening. Um, and that differs from an executive session where you're just, period, not allowed to be in that. I think we got this. Thank you. <laughs> Great. No problem. Um, it's it's as much of a challenge for me as it is for everyone here. So I, I have to have Tucker help me through this. So um, the the commission's agenda here has to include uh, information that will allow the public to access the live stream of the meeting. And they also have to post the video recording of the meeting and make it available for inspection and copying under the Public Records Act. So this is, again, different from that interview we talked about earlier, which specifically excludes these requirements. So an individual who doesn't want their interview with the commission to be public, never available for Public Records Act access. Uh, it's a closed meeting. It's not required. It may be recorded, but it's not available to the public. Um, and then this is an actual meeting of the commission that's open to the public. So there's the open meeting. There's the closed meeting that the public can view either contemporaneously or later. And then there's the executive sessions, which are completely closed. Um, <clears throat> the last piece of this, if you turn to page 11, um, this addresses the issue of the commission being uh, a three-member body, um, and it, it provides that deliberations of a quorum or more of the members of the commission shall not be subject to the Vermont Open Meeting Law. So, in other words, the commission members could finally meet to discuss the business of the commission without having to notice a meeting. Uh, to uh, meet, whether it's two of them or all three of them, when a third commissioner is appointed. Representative Hank. Thank you. And that's just because this is a three person commission. If it were a five person commission, this piece would not be. Yeah, if it were a five person commission, you could still you could still add this, but this would not not be necessary right now. They're they're stuck where they have to is an intermediary if they're discussing anything besides basic operational. Has this language been used for other three member bodies? No. Okay. We're gonna, should it be? Well, I think that that's a big part of why we're having the gravity that's in the room right now about you know, this as a, a way to get around this issue because we do have other very serious quasi judicial three member bodies. So I think about the Public Utility Commission, for example. Um, and I'm interested as we go through this process to learn a little bit more about how we've gotten around this issue in the past. Um, I'm going to take Representative Higley and then I'll give you again, Representative Henry. Uh, th thank you. Damien, if you could go back up to uh, section nine uh, again, it'd be uh, little a number one. And, and I think maybe Tucker explained this. I'm sorry I was late again, but when it talks about a quorum or more of the commissioners may attend a regular. So we're talking two, correct? Yeah, so two uh, or or all three of the commissioners could attend a regular special or emergency meeting by electronic means. Um, so in other words, they don't have to be in the same room to have a quorum for a meeting. Okay, thank you. Yep. 
And I um, wanted to follow up on your statement that that probably would apply if there are any three member select boards left in the state of Vermont, correct? Okay. I'm going to tuck her down a bit since we're on this. That's okay. For, for this particular provision, I want to know two things for you. The first is that deliberations is a very specifically defined term in the open meeting law. And it essentially means the weighing of evidence and the arguments of parties or, you know, similar items that have come before the board, but it expressly excludes um, the taking of evidence and the arguments of the parties. And the reason it's defined that way, and you just mentioned this, is that the deliberations of quasi judicial bodies are broadly excluded from the open meeting. So this is essentially saying that the deliberations of this body, whether or not it's quasi judicial, are excluded from the open meeting law. They're allowed to have discussions, weighing evidence, talking about the arguments that have been brought before the board, um, discussing essentially the issues of the body, but not taking action and not coming to conclusions or weighing the evidence. Or excuse me, what is the term? <laughs> taking evidence. Does everyone feel like they're on solid ground with the distinction between deliberations and the other activities of this commission and other bodies? So this this exemption, which can appear really broad, is specifically an exemption that's about the weighing of evidence, not about the collection of evidence, and not about they can't make any decisions outside of what they do. And that's not that's not unique. This is not unique for quasi judicial bodies. This provision being so specific to one public body is unique. Uh, there's only one parallel that you could make, and that's the Crime Victim Compensation Board. And to navigate all of the specific issues that come up, for example, dealing with threats to the war allowing access to people to those meetings who are the people who perpetrated the crimes and they're there to witness the victims being asking for compensation and maybe attempting to intimidate them, things like that. The way the General Assembly navigated trying to give carve-outs to the Crime Victims Compensation Board was to completely exempt that board from the review. Just, one, just that one particular board. One other body that I think of, and that's uh, the Community Restorative Justice. Um, I can't remember if they're councils or boards, but yeah. those community Maybe. organizations are exempt from you as well. Okay, no, I represent Boyd. Just to clarify, you put some paper. Did you say they can or cannot come to a decision? They cannot, they cannot, they can't take formal action. This is strictly for deliberation. Okay. okay, we're all going to be thinking a lot about what deliberation means. <laughs> uh, I want everybody to put that in their pocket. This is not the first time this is, this is not the last time this will come up in this committee this year. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's keep going, Dean. Thank you. Okay, so that that's it for section nine. Uh, which brings us to section 10, another brand new section under the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's uh, Enabling Act. And this uh, would create a new section 912 called Affinity Group Sections Duty of Confidentiality. Uh, and earlier in this bill, uh, we've created express authority for the commissioners to establish affinity groups for individuals uh, who have experienced discrimination as a result of a um, state law or state program or something like that, uh, that they encounter. Um, but the affinity groups are not uh, necessarily, are not necessarily run by the commission. There's something the commission can establish and it, uh, the commission can talk a little bit more about how they would work. Um, I sort of understand on a basic level, um, but I think that they can give you a better understanding of how these would work. But the key thing here is this, it's an opportunity for individuals who have experienced some sort of discrimination 
uh, or hardship to share with other people who have experienced something similar. So obviously some really personal information could come out. Uh, so uh, the first subsection, subsection A, provides that the meetings and sessions of those groups shall be confidential and privileged, and that commission staff and participants shall be subject to a duty of confidentiality and shall keep confidential any information that they learn during those sessions. Um, the next uh, subsection there provides that a person who attended an affinity group session can bring a private action, a civil action in court for damages resulting from a breach of the duty of confidentiality. So in other words, if they are harmed because someone else reveals what they revealed during the affinity group session, uh, but reveals it publicly, uh, they can then seek damages and compensation for that harm. So this is similar to uh, if someone invades your privacy now, you could bring an invasion of privacy action in court, um, or if someone slanders you or uh, something like that, you can bring an action for that harm that results from those statements. Uh, so this creates uh, an affirmative right of action in statute so that uh, there's, there's a clear tie to what happened in the affinity group. And then um, subsection C simply provides that this doesn't otherwise limit or affect application of common law duties of confidentiality. Um, or any action that could be brought um, for a breach of that duty. So this is basically saying we're creating an express right of action. We're not intending to limit people's ability to argue that other rights they would normally have uh, may have been breached. Um, so before I go to Representative Higley, uh, I want to flag and maybe our fabulous committee assistant can help remind me of this. Uh, I don't know that we're the best committee equipped to really evaluate this section. Um, I'd love to have House Judiciary at least do a drive-by um, if we move this forward and, and on Section 10, because I this right of action is probably, we're a little out over our skis, I think, getting too deep in the weeds on this, but. Right. <laughs> Representative Higley, go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my comments as well, um, whether judiciary or somebody else looks at this, I mean, who's the action being brought against? Who's going to represent? Is it is it they're suing the state of Vermont? They're suing uh, who, who are they suing and who's going to represent? So I'll give you an example. Uh, an affinity group is uh, set up. Person A discloses something private during the affinity group session. Person B, uh, after the affinity group session, decides for whatever reason that they're going to publish this information. They put it on Facebook, they put it in a magazine article, whatever it is. By publishing that information, person A, who, who shared their story and has now had it splashed out in public experiences harm. They might, uh, could be something like the loss of a job. Uh, it could be other financial harm, reputational harm within their community. Now they've been outed as something that they was a deeply private family experience and it's been outed in the community. It affects their ability. Person A who shared the information and has now been harmed because it was publicly disclosed outside the affinity group can sue person B because person B is the person who committed that harm against them. This is the same as uh, if you have two people and uh, there is there is privileged information and then the person who receives that information without getting permission, shares it publicly and invades the privacy of the person who shared that information with them that was protected by the privilege. So right now it's it's 
the same thing as that, where it's it's the the person who disclosed it is subject to a potential lawsuit, and the person who is harmed by the disclosure, who shared the information in the first place, can bring a potential lawsuit. So it's not the state of Vermont who's a defendant here, uh, unless the I, state I, is the one who published it. Uh, yeah, oh. if I could if I could have a follow up, uh, Damien. So what if it is one of the commissioners that releases that information that isn't wasn't wasn't uh, supposed to be released? Would would the state represent them or are they on their own? Uh, so that that's a much much more involved question because um, you're you're getting into whether they whether the breach occurred uh, in in uh, them carrying out their duties as a commissioner or whether it occurred outside of their duties as a commissioner. So it, it gets more complicated when you're talking about a state official, um, whether it's a commissioner or a state, any state official who has access to confidential information breaching that duty. Um, the question is, did the breach occur while they were uh, while they were uh, carrying out their duties as a state official in good faith, or did it occur outside of sort of the scope of their duties as a state official? So it's, it's a little bit different question then. And if it's outside of the scope of their duties as a state official, the attorney general's office, which would normally represent a state official, may argue that it, it, they didn't do this as a state official, they did it as a private individual and we're not going to defend them. Um, and then there are, are a whole host of other pieces here that I, I don't pretend to be the best attorney in the office to answer things like qualified immunity and, and so forth for uh, officials carrying out their duties. Um, and so I, I really don't wanna to get too deep here because I think I'm gonna end up saying something that's not quite right. But the baseline here is, is if it was a commissioner or a member of the commission staff that breached the confidentiality, the, the state would be looking at whether they did it within the scope of their duties and then making a determination at that point. So it's, it's a, that's a much more involved question. Okay, thank you for that, Damien. Yeah. And, and I will say that once we get through the, the walkthrough, I'm hoping we'll have a little bit of time today and certainly more time when we pick this back up to talk with uh, the commissioners and general counsel who are here uh, about the context for some of this. So appreciate everybody getting the words on the page and then we'll do what we usually do and try to build some context around our understanding of it. So that's sections eight, nine, and 10. Uh, section 11 is the effective date. Uh, and sections one through seven, I can start running through those. I don't know what your schedule is. I'm sorry, section 11 is an appropriation. Section 12 is the effective date. Um, so I can start back at the beginning and run through as far as we can get, or I can. Yeah, I think that's a good call. Um, okay. Barring any, um, <clears throat> I think it'll be pretty <clears throat> self-explanatory. Um, the previous sections are a lot less uh, yes. in terms of things to weigh, but I uh, just wanted to put a bow on this. So does anybody else have any questions right now about sections eight, nine, and 10, open meeting law? This, we will come back to these. So I just, we're doing our first walk there. I just want to make sure there wasn't anything that was super confusing or than anybody. Not seeing hands, so we'll. Okay. Start back up at the top. Thank you. So if we go back to section one, uh, this is the sunset for the commission. Uh, and what we're doing in this bill is we're pushing out all the dates for the commission by 10 months uh, because the commission got established more slowly than the timeline that was set out in the original bill. Um, and so this is to give them sufficient time to do their work. So instead of uh, ceasing to exist on July 1, 2026, they would cease to exist on May 1, 2027. And you'll see this repeated over the next several pages. Um, section two, same thing, the term of each commissioner ends on May 1, 2027 when the commission ceases to exist. 
Section three gets to the issue that was brought up at our first discussion of this, where we created this selection panel to select the commissioners. And then uh, as soon as they would selected the commissioners, the panel ceased to exist. And now, unfortunately, one of the commissioners has resigned. And so there's an open spot. So this would reconstitute a se selection panel um, that would only be five members. Given the timeline, um, the way it's been drafted in this bill, uh, instead of having uh, appointees select a panel of people who are not appointed by a state official, this is going back to more of a traditional state appointment process. So your selection panel would be the executive director of racial equity or designee, the executive director of the Center for Independent Living or designee, an individual, and then an individual appointed by the speaker, the committee on committees, both of whom shall not be current members of the General Assembly, and then an individual appointed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So the governor is not listed on here as, uh, with an appointment power because the executive director of racial equity is the governor's appointee. So, um, so that, that would be a five person panel. <clears throat> You'll notice a lot of strike through on page three that's getting rid of the process from before. Um, and then uh, going down to page four, we're striking out the ability of the selection panel to establish and maintain an office because we're not paying for an office uh, that they would largely not use, uh, and also to hire temporary staff. Um, again, uh, there's because they're not doing a large search for the whole panel, we're uh, limiting them a little bit. The term of the panel members would begin on the day, date of appointment and would end on the day the commission ceases to exist. So this panel would be permanent. Important things to note, if someone steps down during that time, uh, if they're an appointee, we'll provide later on that the appointing authority will just appoint someone new. Uh, and then if it's uh, someone who's serving ex officio, like the executive director of racial equity, where just by virtue of being that person, they're the appointee or they appoint someone. If that person changes, then the position on the panel changes. Does that make sense? I just want to flag one thing. Uh, we found on other boards is that a member of the selection panel could be a member of the General Assembly. They just wouldn't be able to be appointed by the House or the Senate. It would be appointed by one of the other three. Right. Yes. That is a very good point. Um, the. Uh, let's see. Going down, the only other changes we've added to the existing language for the panel uh, is that pan members of the panel who are not otherwise compensated by the state are entitled to per diem and reimbursement of expenses. Uh, the understanding being that at the very least, it's likely that at least uh, one or two of the members will be compensated by the state. So, um, <clears throat> And then the panel has administrative and legal assistance from the commission staff. So uh, that's why they don't need to hire their own staff. Uh, <clears throat> and then a member of the panel that is appointed may be removed by the appropriate appointing authority for incompetence, failure to do their job, malfeasance, or illegal acts. So um, we're providing some ability here to not be stuck with the selection panel if something happens down the road and one of the members is uh, perhaps not the best fit anymore. Uh, and then a vacancy can be filled by the appropriate appointing authority. Section four, um, get this to the selection of commissioners. And this is where we address the current problem on the commission of having a vacancy. 
before we get going into section four, Representative Higley has a stand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative. No, that's fine. Just going back, I don't know if it would be in that section three or not, but uh, I don't see any deadline that the panel has to uh, appoint a new commissioner. Uh, is that purposely left out? What's what's people's thoughts on that? So that that is left out in this draft, uh, in part because uh, it's not clear when this bill will pass. Um, it does take effect on passage. Um, you could provide within, you know, 60 or 90 days, something like that. Um, but it, it is left out. <clears throat> uh, again, you know, in a, like you say, we don't have a lot of time for discussion, but I think if we're talking about a time frame and this thing's moving on and we've already extended things 10 months, you know, I would think there would have to be some sort of a time frame for that. If the commissioners can't work with two, they need three. There's got to be a timeline for them to get it done. Thank you. And that, that change would go right into section four um, there. So we would we would probably just amend that subsection D, make that change. Yeah, so I'm seeing a lot of nodding uh, to this, and it, I, I think it seems fairly obvious uh, now that Representative Higley's pointed it out. So do we, um, in the, I, I guess what I'd like to understand before we settle on a date. So I think what we'll put a pin in for our, fabulous drafts people is that we do want to set a time frame. I'd love to hear from uh, commission staff and, and other folks about what this, because I don't know all the details about the original selection, but how much time they need and what would be a reasonable number to put in there. Representative Chase. The problem with that would be is if somebody else uh, resigns, then that date is in statute for filling this one position. But then we could make it a time frame, though, yeah. uh, for all like vacancies. Like 60 days or something. Yeah. I was going to suggest yeah. that if we're going to have an end line, let's leave it flexible for when we start the clock. Yeah. So so let's let's think about this. So we know it's something we'll have to put in a future draft, but. Uh, want to get through the bill and just acknowledge that this is something we should try to get in there <laughs> make sure we get it right <laughs> okay All right. thank you so section five creates a brand new section in the enabling law and this is section 905a this this was requested by the commission um and it's something that we if you'll remember back to our first discussion um, about the bill history that was actually taken out of the original bill, and that's removal of power for the selection panel. So this would provide that the selection panel may, after notice and an opportunity for a hearing, reprimand or remove the commissioner for incompetence, failure to discharge the commissioner's duties, malfeasance, illegal acts, <coughs> excuse me, or other actions that the panel determines would substantially and materially harm the credibility of the commission or its ability to carry out its work. So this essentially, again, gets to the issue of uh, if at some point between now and 2027, something uh, unforeseen happens that would tarnish the credibility of the commission or uh, prevent it from being able to actually do its work. The selection panel could have a hearing and move to remove a commissioner for one of these reasons only. So they have to make a finding that the commissioner engaged in activity that was either malfeasance, illegal activity, um, uh, showed incompetence, or a failure to discharge their duties under the law or uh, was some other act that would substantially and materially harm the commission's uh, credibility or its ability to carry out its work. So it's, it's similar to removal language that we have for some of our other um, boards where there's a specific term and then we provide for removal only for certain causes. Representative. 
So who would decide, who would make that finding the other two, the remaining two commissioners that are the, in question? The selection panel. The selection panel. Yep, so it goes back to that panel of five. Oh, sorry, is so, that right there? So there, yeah, it goes back to that panel of five who would then appoint her replacement. And so if I understand it, Damien, the, the panel exists kind of out there, but only when called upon to fill a vacancy or deal with a, you know, an issue uh, the commissioners along with uh, they would come together and meet, but they're not, they're not meeting regularly unless one of these duties present. So, uh, right. <clears throat> Other questions on that section? Um, just, a, just a quick one. Thank you. So the selection panel, does that have to be a majority of the selection panel? Is that specified anywhere? Uh, it is not specified. It is actually specified here. Um, sorry, I was going to say it's specified in the previous section, but it's actually specified in line 11 on page 6. Reprimand or removal shall only be authorized by a majority vote. <clears throat> Okay. So in section six, we're adding the power um, for the commission to establish affinity groups in which individuals who have experienced institutional, structural, or systemic discrimination, or are members of a population or community that has experienced that, um, may participate for purposes of sharing experiences and providing mutual support. So it's a it's a may. They may do this. They're not required to, but they may do it. In section seven, we're pushing out the report dates by 10 months, just like in the prior uh, section, pushing out the existence of the panel or the commission, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and section eight brings us back to where we were earlier. And the only other thing to note in here, and this will be something that goes across the hall to appropriations, I assume, is that section 11 includes an appropriation of 1.1 million for FY25, which was the original annual appropriation in the, that was projected in the fiscal note, and which the commission uh, has not received the full funding that was projected in the fiscal note as their need this point. So again, they can speak to that, but this is asking for full funding for the commission. And otherwise, the bill would take effect on passage. So whenever it gets through the process, it'd be able to start the process of getting that third commissioner on the on the commission. And now we're we've closed the loop on all the language. Chairperson Cooper. Uh, I think this is a question for you, actually. Um, what exactly is our timeline on this fix? So, uh, obviously, this is a decision for us as a committee, uh, but I tried to give us some background information and get us enough to be thinking about this uh, and getting to work on it, obviously, in the early days of the session, because I don't want us to sure. know where at. I, I, it's my intention, if it's the, if the committee agrees, we kind of Viciously. Uh, I would agree with that. The reason I ask is because I'm just we're dealing with concepts that are sunsetting, right? And then we're also going to create extensions to some of those things. And there's components to this that are certainly permanent. Are we going to impact some of the more permanent stuff? Or so this is a card, I'll kind of bounce that over to Damien. So as I see the construction of this bill. All of the, it's basically saying we're doing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission the way we passed it last biennium. We've acknowledged that we didn't really, weren't able to start its duty, so we're pushing it up 10 months. So all the needs, everything just moves up 10 months. So in that sense, we're not really reinventing anything right. after all those changes. So then this, uh, I want to hear um, from some of the folks about the affinity groups, because that's the one kind of new thing, sure. new power. And then we're reconstituting the selection panel in order to have some body to help fill right. the vacancy and deal with this unforeseen issue. 
Um, and then there's all the open meeting stuff. So this, those are kind of the buckets. Right. But does that, um, I don't know if that really answers your well, question. Well, it does actually. That's a great answer. Yeah. I'm curious <laughs> to know how much of the, how much digging we're going to do in that last bucket, which is open meeting law itself. I mean, I'm curious to know when executive session was first established. Oh, God. If we're going to talk about that stuff. So what I would say is that this is a, almost like a reverse echo of what we're going to have to do when we look at all the open meeting and remote meeting authority, which I assume we will do in the content context of S55. Okay. Um, and I will commit to the committee that if I'm wrong and we do not get a bill on this from the Senate this session, we will all get together and do a committee bill. I know all of my my committee is very or my community is very interested in what is going to happen after July first with this temporary open you know remote meeting authority right. Yeah. So obviously we're touching on some of the same concepts here, but you know we're I don't think we're going to solve all the problems. One of the things that made me feel a little more comfortable was I asked, is this modeled on what we did in Act One last year, where we did the temporary extension through this coming July? of the remote meeting authority and open meeting law uh, that we had done during COVID. And Tucker basically said, with the addition of the requirements around video recording, yes, it's basically the same. So that kind of made me feel like we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on that here because that's already the temporary law for every other body uh, with that you know, recording requirement. Being so added. it sounds to me like you're saying, if we don't satisfy my hopes and the committees for dealing with some of that more in-depth policy, we will. Yeah, and if we kind of get it a little bit wrong in some way that is unforeseen as if we pass this bill quickly and we don't quite have the remote authority exactly how we want, when we get to doing the permanent adoption of the remote authority, we could try to harmonize everything yeah. um, and sort of say, you know, truth and rec, here's the rules, go do your work. But then you're going to be subject to whatever the general law is that we pass, you know, unless we're notwithstanding sure. and allowing there to be. So we are going to have to harmonize any remote authority that's out there with whatever we, we pass in the future. But I think at this point, we just want to like get past this particular thing where we set up a commission that now can't do its work because of some of these unforeseen issues. So. Those are great questions. Thank you. Representative Hank. Thank you. I'm not sure who can answer this question out of anybody who's here, but during this time where we're kind of on pause because there are only two commissioners, what's happening with the commissioner's salaries right now? Are they being paid um, during this time or? So I, I, I'll happy to let the commission speak for themselves. Okay. So my understanding is that their work is ongoing and the commission and its staff are being paid, um, but that they're just not able to have non-public meetings right now. That's that's the issue is that when they when the two commissioners get together, it has to be a public meeting or they're something like this where they're attending another body's meeting. Okay, that's good enough. So, Thank you. Representative Higley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, quickly, uh, and maybe it's been said previously, but uh, when did the commissioners actually get started and when was the resignation of that one commissioner? So we started April 1st. Could you identify each one? Yeah, so my name is Melody um, Atkin and I'm one of the commissioners for the TRC. Um, so we started April 1st, and then um, Patrick, uh, Commissioner Sandin, he left, I think his last day was um, November 2nd, if I remember correctly. November 3rd. So, November 3rd, yeah. Um, so we have continued to, to do our work, and um, we have plenty of things to do, and we can do them separately. So, um, and we're still having public meetings. You will see all of that in our report, uh, which will be to you by Friday. So you'll have all of that. So we are still continuing. It isn't that we've stopped, but um, Commissioner Sandin was very important, especially in terms of disability and lenses that we totally need to do this work. And so, um, we are, we may need to hire a consultant if we do not, if we're not able to get somebody quickly. Um, 
that makes sense. We have pieces in this work that needs to be rounded out by a third commissioner, and they have to write certain pieces. Okay, uh, thank you. So, so again, I couldn't really hear real well, but so April 1st, the commissioners got started. November 3rd, the commissioner who resigned, resigned, correct? Correct. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I think we've gotten through the words on the page. Um, so I um, wanted to know if uh, the general counsel, uh, if the commissioners had um, any either prepared testimony or whether you might be interested uh, in taking a few questions to round out our understanding uh, of how all this is going to work. So I don't know if it would make sense um, if if you all would, uh, whoever would like to, to testify, I'm willing to defer to you in terms of how, how you'd like to um, engage with us and help us understand a little bit. I, I think in particular, um, it might be a good place to um, to just talk generally um, and then get into the affinity um, groups and, and where that proposal's coming in, because that's one piece that's new. But um, welcome, uh, Commissioner, and I know you have your general counsel here, so thank you for joining us. I'll let you introduce yourselves, and then we can open it up for some questions. And we have Mia. Uh, the other commissioner is here as well. So, um, Mia, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, you're muted, Mia. Sure, yeah. Uh, Mia Schultz, I'm, the, I'm a Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner. Joining you from Bennington, Want, knew that there was going to be some weather coming back. So um, sorry, I can't be in person, but uh, it's a two and a half hour, you know, drive. So and back there and back. So so just like like emphasizing again uh, why it's so important to have these uh, virtual options. I'm sure um, um, you'll be discussing that further um, as we go forward. Anyway, thanks for having me here. Thanks for being here. And just to reiterate, uh, my name is Melody Mackin. I'm the other commissioner, so we're now a commission of two. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mia's in Bennington. I'm in Barry, and um, I'm Michelle Oliveira. I'm general legal counsel. Um, and thank you so much for having us. Uh, Damien, did you? Oh, there you are. Yep. Uh, did a great job. So the things that we were going to testify about, basically, we were going to sort of do different pieces of the bill. Um, I certainly don't need to do that anymore. Um, so I'm just happy to take questions. I don't know if Mia or Melody had just a few things to say before we take questions. Um, I I feel like Damien did an excellent job. I was like, oh, well, um, I don't want to do this. <laughs> um, but there's certainly pieces that we can talk about. So what questions do you all have for us that we can answer? I think the general, the first general question I have is um, what uh, the affinity groups are, sort of how that fits in your practice, and just so we understand sort of why the ask of that new power. Um, I'm curious more than anything, but I want to know a little bit about the genesis of uh, that language that's in the bill. Yeah, so we wanted to be mindful um, of the trauma that people have when they come to talk to us. People have been incredibly generous in sharing with us uh, some of their stories and also their ideas. Um, during public meetings, we've been really uh, privileged to be able to be guided by the public. And we also want to be really sensitive to the fact um, that it's hard for people and it has hurt them. So part of their process of restoration, I think, may be aided by what really, I think, in common talk is just like support groups or group work, right? People that have suffered similar harms. Uh, folks, we've heard from folks that, you know, that experience sterilizations or different kinds of discriminations, uh, really harmful, really hurtful things. Um, and if they would like to talk with other people that have experienced like things, uh, then we wanna be able to facilitate that for them. Um, we also know, and people have said, I don't want to advertise. This is really uh, maybe embarrassing or maybe just personal for myself and my family. And we don't want that to be advertised. So that was the confidentiality piece of that. Um, Representative, go ahead. 
Thank you. So rather than interviewing individuals on their own, your concept is to create a supportive group setting for folks to share. No, no, no not rather than. If he, and it's by statute. If someone would like to be interviewed and tell us their stories, we do hope that they do. And um, that would be really helpful to us in terms of formulating how we might fix discrimination in the future statutorily or provide public forums uh, for people to have reconciliation and truth during those forums. But in support of how they move on personally, right, having experienced that trauma, we've now potentially created more drama by them telling us their stories. That's a separate piece. Okay, so the affinity groups I'm following you follow their testimony to you where they exposed themselves and potentially brought up more trauma and the affinity groups are support groups for them who have all go, gone through this process of testifying to the truth and reconciliation. Right, the purpose, the goal being reconciliation. Thank you. And let me give you a little, go ahead, uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Melody, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to give a little bit of context <laughs> um, because so we're the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The second part of that is reconciliation. So what are the tools that you need to be able to help people in a community move forward? Because it's it's we're going to need things like if we decide to do this, right? Um, how can we best support people? It's not enough if someone's coming to us to tell their truth. This is why we're still in the building and planning phase and we're working on a strategic plan because all of these questions have to be lined up before somebody sits in front of us and is telling us these really hurtful things. Um, and we wanna make sure we can support them, right? So this is one tool we could have if we decide to do it. Um, and it's a, I feel like it could be a very useful rec uh, reconciliation tool if that makes sense um, if it happens, but yeah. Mia, did you have and something? Just, yeah, just to build on on that, you know, really um, part of our work that we've done, you know, publicly is create a mission statement. And part of that mission statement is about uplifting and centering the people who have been harmed and their truths. I mean, that that's why we're here. That's why we were formed. And that is also part of the pathway towards our healing and our collective healing together uh, as, as, as a state. And as these individuals, um, um, you know, decide or decide to tell their truths, and so we want to be able to offer as many options that feel comfortable and and safe, quite frankly, uh, for those people. And affinity groups mm -hmm. is, you know, one of the many options, as my colleagues have said, towards that mission of of healing, quite frankly. And and I would also say that. Um, you know, just generally, uh, we want this to be um, reparative for all of us. Um, and that means giving options in every way possible. Um, and so that's, you know, kind of the thinking of the affinity spaces, um, just adding an extra layer of safety. Thank you. That really helped my understanding of what you're trying to get at and realizing, and David, I think you did a good job of emphasizing it's a may, right? So it's giving you a power to, to set things up. Uh, Representative Hickley, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Um, I do have a, a question. Um, I believe the wording initially, uh, in a sense, was uh, any group or individuals that have been adversely affected by Vermont's laws and policies. Um, again, I think what I'm hearing you say is uh, you're going to accept anybody's testimony that feels that they were adversely affected, but you're not going to make a determination whether or not that was rightly, rightly just, right? I mean, uh, and then I guess my second question is when you were talking about options, uh, what are we talking about there? What, what options are we talking about? Well, I, the, on the first piece of it, you're asking about um, whose whose cases do we uh, deliberate about? 
Um, and thus far, when we presented some emblematic cases at our emblematic case meetings, uh, we first, uh, the commissioners vote on whether that is uh, discrimination under the statute, whether they fall into one of those groups or another group that uh, the commissioners want to put into their purview. Um, so that's one. Two, we do not, uh, we are not a body where there's hearings on each case to decide uh, who was wrong, like who was the person that committed that wrong, what should happen to them in terms of punishment. That's not what we're about. We're not, yeah, we're not modeled on that sort of hearing and uh, decision-making type body. Oh, I'll let Mia do that other, the other piece of that. Yeah, yeah, we're not, uh, just to emphasize, we're not, um, the original statute, the original law does not make us a governing body. Uh, so we do not get to like say for certain whether or not somebody is specifically guilty of a specific course of action, right? But what we do hope is that the state and the people who are um, attached to the state, right, whether it be yourselves, legislators, or people who work in government agencies uh, do participate in this process because it's critical to the pathway to um, restoration. So it's not a matter of um, blame. It's a matter of um, moving forward and not ignoring, you know, what's been our harm, the harm that's been done by in the hands of the state. So, um, so, and that was all determined in our initial legislation. Um, in terms of other, you know, what other options they might have, it would be a one-on-one -on -one option. It could be um, a public forum type of option. It could be sure. the affinity spaces. It can, you know, those are the types of options um, that we've been exploring for, um, what we're calling testimony right now or storytelling, right? So again, testimony, some of these language does bring up an idea that this is a governing body, but we're not. And thank and you. Also, and again, that, oh, that, that I was going to say the state, oh. has, the state has many advocacy groups and support groups that will also, you know, give referrals that people might avail themselves of. Again, that helps me uh, when you talked about options. I was concerned that it was options for some sort of reparations or whatever at this point, but you're saying the options are for getting their word out to you folks. Uh, and and I, I understand that better now. Thank you. And at the end of all of this, we are submitting a report of recommendations. So whether you take them or not is a, is up to you, or you know just in general um, the community and and pathways to how Vermont can be a place where everybody because this has to be everybody right. Um, all people in Vermont should have a stake in a better place, right, in a place where everyone can thrive. So we make our recommendations, and we don't um, we don't have the power afterwards to do anything. Yeah. It's all up to you. Right? And it's up to people. Whoever sits in these seats in 2027. <laughs> exactly. So, no, we're not making determinations. Great. Um, are there other things um, that after this first walkthrough of the bill um, that we should be thinking about in particular that you wanted to highlight? Is there anything that um, we should particularly focus on as we look to go from this draft to something that we can get out of our committee. This may, um, this will certainly have uh, at least a stop in appropriations um, if we pass it in anything like the draft form. So it's got a, a other other folks that I'm. Maybe this, to, maybe yeah, this is ahead. a faux pas, but I wanted to ask you all just like there was a mention about the budget, and that is in um, in the. Um, the proposed legislation about the 1.1 million um, that was initially allotted to us in our original legislation, uh, but we did not receive that amount. Um, that basically covers our staff's um, um, salaries. Um, we had to get some computers. We had to get set up an office. You know, we have those expenses, but um, 
so we're asking for the original amount back that we were initially legislated. That's and, right. and Mr. If I understand this right, this is this as it's written, it's fiscal year twenty five. Um, right. So okay. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> so Bless you. well, that that's more of a question for our colleagues across the hall in the appropriations okay. committee. But I think the signal that we would be giving is that from a policy perspective, you know, we support the work of the commission if we pass anything like this draft bill. Um, and of course, we'd want you to have the resources that you need. I guess my question is, in the current appropriations process, have you, um, what, what, what was the determination that was made? What, what were you budgeted if you have that information handy? Um, I, yeah, I did ask, um, the original was 748,000 is okay. what we were budgeted, we were given when we started, or that's what we have now, this year. Okay, so it's so the fiscal year this, this fiscal 24 year. that we're in right now. Yep. And so the yep. ask for fiscal year 25, which starts July 1st is the 1.1. 1 .1. Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks. Fiscal years. Uh, we don't we don't talk about that a ton over in the side of the hall. Uh, <laughs> but thanks for clearing that up, Commissioner. <laughs> yeah, we definitely don't want to start to play appropriations committee over here in GovOps. I've tried to keep the firewall as uh, <laughs> tight as possible. <laughs> we tell them what we think is important, and they figure out how to divvy up the money. Um, Great. Well, we've hit the 2.30 mark. Yes. Um, I, we do have one open slot on our schedule later in this week. And so um, I'll be conferring with folks offline about when we pick this back up again, but it could be as early as Thursday afternoon just to um, set some expectations. But I really appreciate everybody's thoughtful questions on this today and for all of you being here. And Commissioner Schultz, no apologies if you don't want to make the drive all the way up here. This virtual option works great. Um, happy to have you that way. Um, Let me know if you need any more uh, reinforcement on that, right? <laughs> it's hard living in Bennington, I'll tell you. So, um, committee. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you for being here. Um, so, we're going to uh, just take a short break. We will come back on at 2.45. Um, I, in the spirit of trying to both hear bill introductions from things we didn't get to hear last year, and also try to keep some things topically revel relevant. I've asked uh, Representative Stebbins to present uh, her ideas from uh, H194. So we'll pick uh, that up with a quick just bill introduction um, because it has to do with some of the um, areas that we're talking about with government accountability that we're gonna hear from at three. So we'll be back at 245. All right, welcome back uh, to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs on Tuesday, January 9th. Um, we're here for the second half of our Tuesday afternoon, afternoon is going to be devoted to um, a look at government accountability. And I wanted to start with a bill uh, that was um, referred to us last year. And um, I appreciate Representative Stebbins joining us uh, to introduce uh, 8494, and I think her thoughts on this may uh, contribute to our discussion of the Summer Government Accountability Committee's report and um, the future work we have in flushing out and understanding their recommendations. So, Representative Stebbins, thanks for being the uh, opening act of our government accountability work this year. Thank you, Chair McCarthy. Uh, and for the record, uh, I'm Gabrielle Stebbins. I'm a representative serving the South End of Burlington, uh, and my day job when not a state rep uh, is I manage a lot of projects and programs, and I do a lot of evaluation of how states are doing with various energy uh, programs. So across the 50 states, looking at how different, uh, different groups of people are rolling out programs that state legislators give them. So first of all, thank you so much. Um, uh, you know, when I was first elected back in 2021, I uh, co-sponsored a bill that actually called for a working group to look at what we should do. Should so thank you very much for having that working group last summer. Um, if you notice, H-194 is a short form bill. Uh, basically, I, you know, after working on the, we should have a working group concept, uh, I stepped back and I said, you know, 
there really just needs to be committee discussion and testimony and a lot more uh, weigh in from folks who audit programs and evaluate policies to see how they're working. Uh, so that's why it's a short form bill, but in the event you haven't read it recently, I'll just read it to you quickly. The bill proposes to create the legislative office of government accountability and strategic planning in the legislative branch to assist the general assembly in one monitoring and improving the performance of state government two, evaluating the operations and efficacy of state agencies, departments, and programs. Three, developing strategies to harness Vermont's strengths through prioritized investments in individuals and businesses, the economy, the natural environment, and infrastructure. Four, assessing the extent to which state government is sufficiently and appropriately staffed to meet its obligations, and five, ensuring that public funds are being used appropriately and in the manner for which they were appropriated or otherwise allocated. So I, I know you're gonna get a rundown in a moment from the summer group. Um, I'm really grateful for their work. They have a lot of recommendations, including some like duh recommendations like, it would be great if we got some reports back more like November 15th, so we could implement them into bill making uh, and sponsoring. Um, I, I want to just set the table a little bit, though, which is I really don't see this as uh, a party based bill. Uh, you know, the founders of our government proposed three branches of government, and they thought they should be equal uh, executive, judicial and the legislature. Uh, we don't have that in Vermont. We have a citizen-based legislature. Uh, we're part-time, we're seasonal, we don't have staff. And two of the elements that came through uh, when I read the summer study working group, one was 80% of the rest of the US states have some form of tracking back to legislators to tell them, hey, you know, that bill you passed really isn't serving your constituents or you know what this bill could be improved this way or maybe you should pour more money into this program and less money into this program so 80 percent other states have this and on top of the fact that we're citizen based we're part-time seasonal uh with no staff we we also have um the third smallest uh legislative council office so we're really trying to do a lot um, within, you know, uh, uh, a certain box. And as a project manager, um, I don't know if you guys have seen, there's, there's this triangle where you can either increase how much money you spend or reduce how much time. It's, it's basically cost, time, uh, or quality. And if you, put tons of money at something, then you can get it done really fast and you can get it done really well. If you don't put much money at something, then maybe, um, you know, maybe it's not done on time and it's done really well, or maybe it's not done very well, but it's done on time. And the point to all of this is how do we know if we're serving Vermonters, if we don't know what the impacts of our laws and the implementation of those programs what those impacts are. How do we know? And uh, I, they're not all 13 of us, um, but I, although we probably, some of us disagree on what the role of government should be or the size of government and how much money we should put to state government, I'm fairly certain we all ran because we wanted to make Vermont a better place according to what we think for Vermonters. Sure. If it's our friends or our neighbors or our vets or whomever, so I really hope, and I'm so grateful that you're picking up this bill. Um, I, don't, I don't know how we improve upon our work if we are not tracking the data and coordinating across agencies and assessing what's working and what's not. Um, let me just see if there's anything else I wanted to say. Uh, I guess the, the other major piece that I, I wanted to say is 
the, the challenge here is cost, right? Like how much do you put into um, assessing how we're performing? Uh, and, you know, there's, there's a saying in the data world, junk in, junk out. If you put in junk data, you're going to get junk data out. So the other piece is how do you ask the right questions to figure out you're going to, to make sure you're getting the answers back that you really want um, so that then you can make the informed choice Please. as to how to move forward. Do you change a law? Do you change a program? Do you get rid of a program? But we can see this across, uh, you know, decades. If it's, if it's EB5, if it's our last, um, you know, our, our last budget vote, uh, with, uh, you know, at the last minute trying to figure out what was going on with housing and the unhoused, we need some mechanism to have a better report back in terms of what's going on and how we can serve better our constituents and our neighbors. Thank you, Kathleen. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I am. I want to recognize that our uh, House co-chair of the Summer Government Accountability Committee has just joined us, Representative Stebbins, and was was saying, "Yes, that's what we're talking about. That's government accountability." Um, so uh, we are hearing. Uh, I wanted to give Representative Stebbins um, the the opportunity to introduce H one ninety four, her short form bill, which was about uh, government accountability, and throw a couple of. Um, the ideas and principles on the table uh, from uh, some of the work that she does uh, in as a prelude to our hearing the report of the Summer Government Accountability Committee. Um, anybody have any questions for Representative Stebbins, Representative Hooper, and then Water Zone? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative, I do beg your pardon if you mentioned this in your overview of the policy of the bill you put before us, but. Regarding the history of the planning office in Vermont, you know, this isn't a new idea, right? This used to exist. From what years did it, for how long and why did we scrap it? Well, it was actually one of my constituents, uh, Governor Howard Dean, uh, who uh, got rid of the uh, government planning office. So I believe that was in the 80s. Um, and I think it was around, I, it was not around for long. Um, and so, you know, I mentioned one of the questions of like the cost, uh, how much money do you put into assessing an evaluation? Um, another question is, where does it sit? You know, does it sit under the executive branch um, in, you know, in my proposal or rather in the bill that I co-sponsored in 2021? It was a new planning office. And one of the questions was, we don't know where it should sit. Uh, in H-194, I put it, you know, clearly, I'm, I'm suggesting clearly that it report to the legislature um, because, you know, after two and a half years under my belt, I was like, I, I know that I voted on all these things and I don't, unless I like dig through the websites or know who to ask for a report, um, then I may not know how whatever I voted on in 2021 has evolved. So, um, it was a while ago, it was in the eighties, uh, and governor Dean got rid of it. I did ask him why about a year and a half ago, but I can't remember okay. his answer. Okay. <laughs> wonder if we could get him to come in and testify. Um, Representative Waters Evans. Thank you. I'm wondering. Um, so there's the summer uh, government accountability committee, and it seems like um, I'm, I'm wondering if there's sort of piecemeal other groups, committees, organizations, maybe even not associated with uh, the legislature or you know the executive branch, but like a nonprofit or something. That's are there any other kind of piecemeal organizations or committees that are doing this work somewhat already that could be so I guess my follow up would be is there a way to combine them or get them to work together or is that just a, a, a puzzle that's too big to put together well I think this uh, a few answers one it sort of depends on what you're 
trying to look at. Yeah. Um, like, for example, there are nonprofits that will dig into certain policy areas to see whether or not we are achieving um, wow. the mandates that we've put into law. So I would say that that's a, a form of accountability, um, but that's probably specific to you know, child welfare or to clean energy policy or whatnot. Um, then we have other areas, you know, I, I served on health trans transportation my first two years and the amount of dashboards and reporting and planning that they have to do for federal grants, et cetera, they do so much of it, but is it, and, and this is again, where there's a bit of a rub. Um, I said cost and I said, who does the accountability report to the, another rub is, um, you know, how do you make sure you're asking the questions that are going to give you the answers that are actionable? Because we can ask a lot of questions, but if you're not actually asking the right questions, then you've got a whole lot of data that you don't know whether or not, you know, a certain policy is working. So that's another piece that I think as you guys take this testimony and as you weigh through this, a key question, and it's probably great for, um, uh, you know, the co-chair who just walked in and is going to present on her work this summer, a key question is, how do you how do you provide enough specificity, but then also flexibility so that as things change, our data collection, our evaluation approach can change? Um, ideally, we would have some form of higher level ongoing sort of report cards at a frequent pace so that we can see the change. And then, you know, we also have the opportunity to do a much deeper dive into specific programs or policy areas. Um, so, but ideally we would get that sort of ongoing dashboard yeah. tracker to see whether or not the work we're doing, the bills we're passing, the um, programs that we're asking the executive branch to implement, whether or not they're having the impact that we are striving for. Um, so, yes, long story short, Representative, there are many groups doing many of this, which is why, uh, you know, um, one of the key areas here is coordination. Um, you know, that the H-194 is drafted and uh, your next, next witness, it's more specific to reporting to the legislature and providing the legislature uh, the tools to assess accountability. Um, which is a little different than whether or not you're trying to assess, like, if you're the Secretary of Transportation, whether or not you're trying to assess whether or not you've, you know, met certain metrics. So that's another piece with the the data and the evaluation that can vary depending on who's doing it. So now that we have both of our co-chairs here, I, I want to pause uh, here on 194 and thank Representative Stebbins for uh, teeing that up and her patience with us getting around to this. <laughs> and I hope that you feel better. <laughs> so I want to hear thank from you. our Summer Government Accountability Committee. So thanks for being with us, Gabrielle. I appreciate being thanks here. Thanks so much, Chair. And thanks, everybody. Thank you. Um, so I, would you like to come together, Senator Brock and Representative Brumstead? Please uh, join us. We're anxious to hear the, re the report out from your committee's work over the summer. I'm gonna, uh, Representative Stebbins is gonna stay. Stay out, she can hear. Thanks. I am. I, I also just wanted to, I apologize as they're taking a seat. I wanted to say one last thing, which is this is sort of basic good business is just being as efficient as we can with our scarce dollars. So hoping that we can really find a path forward. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, Senator Brock and Representative Brom said if you'd like to introduce yourselves and uh, tell us about your work over the summer. Let me start. I'm uh, Randy Brock. Uh, I represent Franklin County and part of Grand Isle County in the Senate and the Senate Minority Leader. And I'm Jessica Brum, uh, Representative Brumstead, and I represent Shelburne and St. George, and I'm in the co chair of the House Human Services Committee. This would be. And we spent uh, the better part of our summer on one particular project that I think is close and it becomes closer to our hearts. And I think it's a project that, that's important for the General Assembly as well. That is on the issue of accountability. Uh, you'll remember that we had 
a government accountability committee that um, uh, we uh, put to rest uh, in the last session. And, and we did so after a considerable period of time because I think many of us felt that we weren't accomplishing what was really intended to be accomplished. And one of those things that we were looking for is to help us deal better with the issue of accountability. Accountability is critically important for uh, a legislative body because you know we pass tons of legislation. We enact lots of things. We spend horrendous amounts of money. And the question always comes at the end of it is, well, did we accomplish what we intended to? And we say, well, it may be something we'll look at at the next session, but we have all this stuff that we have to deal with right now, and we go on and deal with the things we have to deal with now. And often we don't go back. One of the things that we tried with the other accountability committee was to provide training and information to people throughout the body to say, well, how should you look at legislation that you pass? How should you think about the issue of how to be uh, more accountable in what we do? But when we look back, and the look back had to be informal because there wasn't a real process to look back, to say, well, did we accomplish that? Nobody was really able to say. And that, again, was uh, kind of a clue as to how effective our accountability process was. One thing that came out of it is we established uh, uh, kind of indirectly a process in which the administration came back and produces a series of reports to us uh, that says what was accountability like for the administration as a whole for key programs. And we certainly uh, looked at very often adding requirements for agencies of government to report back to the General Assembly on a date at some point in the future, information about what was done in conjunction with a piece of legislation that was passed. And I think for any of you who've been here for a period of time, you know that there is a pile of paper somewhere in a warehouse someplace in Montpelier that contains all of those reports, most of which we've never read. That again was an indication about government accountability as so many things got asked for and reported upon, but reported upon often in such horrendous volume that none of us had time to read it, those of whom actually decided to go read it in the first place. And so we had a challenge in front of us. And one of the, the biggest part of that challenge was to define what do we mean by accountability? And is there something that we should do to uh, look at accountability from uh, a better lens than what we've looked at in the past? Uh, and one of the things that we started doing was looking at, well, gee, rather than reinvent the wheel, maybe somebody's figured out how to do this in some other state better than we have. And so at the way, it's one of the places that we started. Representative Sure. So we, as um, Senator Brack said, we started, we did hear from about 15 different, through NCSL, the National Council of State Legislatures, we heard about about 15 different states and what they were doing. And we sort of landed on Legistat, um, I mean, on New Mexico that had a program called Legistat. And when, what Representative um, Stebbins was talking about when I came in the room uh, about asking the right questions in order to really get at, are we being, how do we measure and how do we collect the data we need to see whether or not we've met the goals of the legislation that we pass? And they have come up with a way by pulling together folks from both um, Joint Fiscal and Ledge Council to really focus on um, accountability. And so it might be a little similar with what, um, uh, Governor Dean sunsetted, it sounds like, but I also think that Governor Dean did that in the 80s, which was right about the time that Senator Snelling had um, gone off to a um, NCSL conference and came back with this whole, um, with what we were before, the Government Accountability Committee, and that, well, that legislation, we, you all just sunsetted, and it was around an outcomes report. And that was really a big new idea, right? And I think in some ways, um, what Representative Stebbins said about the boxes and, you know, how are we meeting, what does it look like? Are we meeting all the things we wanted to? Is someone sort of checking that off? That's what the outcomes report was. And so now here we are 10 years later, sunsetting that because that was more of a look, if you remember when I came here last year, that was more of a look back at, um, what the executive branch was doing. And 
what they, you know, how healthy is from our Vermonters, how, you know, they were putting all the statistics together to try and see if those things were changing over time, which is great. But as far as the legislative branch goes, I think what we, we shot for was really looking at having a system of meaningful accountability for how tax dollars are spent. But we have all, I think, struggled to agree on an effective way to do that. Um, so then, as um, Senator Brock said, we, we listened to NCSL, we heard from the auditor's office, we heard from joint fiscal, we heard from um, ledge council, we heard from the office of, um, let's see if I can get it right, Perform the performance office through the governor's office. Um, and we heard from the Office of Racial Equity. Um, so all of those folks, we, we heard a lot of testimony. Remember, you gave us three meetings to do this work in. We ended up going to the speaker and asking if we could have four meetings. And we didn't, we did get our four meetings, but we didn't get to the second half or the, you know, quite a bit of that, maybe even the second three quarters of the questions. We had, we really tried to stick to government accountability and oversight and look very closely at that. So we came up with some 11 common sense recommendations, allowing the legislatures and the public to keep track of what happens after a law is passed, how new legislation is implemented, how and when dollars are appropriated through budget process as expended. We, oh, the other folks we talked to was LCAR. And we tried to come together on some changes that could be made right away. And um, a lot of that came through the auditor's office and they are already doing it. So one of the things I would recommend to this committee is to hear from LCAR as well. They've made some um, substantive changes around how rules, how the um, rules are written, whether or not they're meeting legislative intent and so, and so forth. So I think that's really important as well. Um, so, the intent really is to re-examine the principle of government accountability um, by focusing on how evidence is used to inform policy, how state laws are carried out, and how our laws can best be written to achieve the intended outcome. So those are sort of the big, the big three. And just as an example, um, right now up in the House Human Services Committee, we are moving forward on a bill that came to us from the Senate um, to ban all flavored tobacco and e-cigarettes. It's really aimed at the zillions of kids who are using flavored e-cigarettes in schools. And we, four years ago, we passed legislation that raised the age to 21, that said no, um, no internet sales, um, just like we don't have any internet sales for cigarettes either. So for e-cigarettes and we, um, the third, oh, raised the taxes um, to the same as what we were charging for cigarettes for e-cigarettes. And so we did those three things that we still have more and more people, more and more kids using e-cigarettes in our schools. So my point to our committee was, okay, before we start taking up the, the Senate bill, Let's look back at that legislation. Let's hear from the attorney general's office and say, hey, are we following up on some of these things that we already um, know that, that kids aren't supposed to have e-cigarettes, right? And, and we hear that the attorney general has some really good information to share with us. We're also following up with the Department of um, Liquor and Lottery and saying, are you guys doing the secret shopper? Are you going into the... Um, uh, our stores and asking the questions and making sure that we're not selling to kids under 21. So that mm -hmm. my point is just that we need as committees also, not only are we talking in these recommendations about um, setting up possibly an, an office that would be oversight and accountable office, but with a, actually with a legislative committee that would work together with this office, as well as to work together with the committees. And the committees would then have the ability to, to think about that when they take on new legislation. So before they take on something new, let's look back and see what we already have. And I think Ledge Council, we ha actually had um, Legislative Council Carby, Jen, Jen 
Harvey come in today to talk about what I was just talking about, but the e -cigs. And I think it, it was really helpful. Everyone around the table was like, oh, that's what we did four years ago. Okay, so how much do we need to do today? So I think that um, it would be helpful to do that. I, I also thought that it might be helpful now to, if you pulled up our um, report, we could just go over the 11 things and see if you have any questions because Senator Brock and I both have sort of lived and breathed these 11 <laughs> recommendations. And you can find them on under other. So if you, committee. So if you go to committee. We have them on oh, you have them page up. for today's oh, testimony. Okay. And um, just see there's a letter that's the kind of the cover letter. Uh, but then I believe the document we should be looking at is the summer GAC recommendations draft 3.7. That were adopted on December 13th of the like. Yes, and I, I think I'm on page three that has that list of 11. If you want to just pull them up, and I and maybe you, we can just sort well, of. Well, the question is which draft, um, the, 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 the document, the summer JAG recommendations is draft 3.6 and 1213. This one doesn't have that. Seven data 1213 on our yeah. page right now. Yeah, that's, that's the one. Yeah, that's the final one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure we're. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And you'll see the back of this report. Yep. We actually put the slides from New Mexico because we thought mm -hmm. they were so helpful. Yep. Um, okay. So, one, I mean, the first one is obvious. We talk about this all the time educating members of the General Assembly on the importance of government accountability, right? We talked. And interrupt me anytime if you have a question um, or send it back so that we can um, help help you all think about each of these. But you know what? You could ask the question, well, haven't you always been doing that? Yes, we have. And we don't usually get that many members. So the idea, again, is to really put another foot forward to um, encourage lots of our, mem our new members, especially, but all of our members to talk about this. And as we as we move through these, you'll see that there are a lot of other changes that will be important for everyone to understand as they go forward, if you decide to take something like this up. There's a linkage between simply the notion of educate and actually achieving some results from that education. Uh, first, to talk about the concepts and uh, methodologies using to do use to uh, deal with the government accountability generally. And we touched on that in the education that was presented uh, by the by the last committee, but also training in data informed decision making, and then also the creation of some tools that could be used on a replicating basis uh, throughout legislation that we construct so that we have some consistency in what we do. So people are tied in to looking for particular things that would help measure the results uh, and outcomes of legislation that we pass. This is the government accountability equivalent of how we in here look for a sunset for every board and commission that gets set up in mm -hmm. those, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So two is create a joint government oversight and accountability mm -hmm. committee. And that might not, that wouldn't be a policy committee that would sit, that would meet during the regular time. It, just so you know, each one of these, so there are 11, and then if you go back through the report, each one is has all kinds of examples and other information next to it. But what we were thinking here is a committee that would probably meet in the summer and fall regularly would work um, alongside or with some input from the auditor's office, as well as with the joint, if we are able to put funding into some new staff that just works on oversight and accountability with committees. Um, through joint fiscal and ledge council, that this committee then would work with them off cycle, you know, off when we're not in session. And one of the things that we saw from looking at the work done in other states, particularly those that whose the state auditors also are involved in an oversight function, is that reports are created uh, under government auditing standards about issues uh, and things to look at, things to improve, things that have created problems elsewhere. Uh, but their mechanisms to ensure that there, in fact, is follow-up. Right now, Vermont has 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 a void. Uh, there can be audit findings and audit findings of significance. Most of the time, uh, those findings are are resolved, but not always. And you certainly have situations in which audit agencies say, "Well, we don't agree with that audit," and things die on the vine and don't get looked at further. Uh, there isn't a a mechanism to continue the oversight process. Uh, to the extent that it should be, and as a result, significant issues potentially die on the vine. 
what we're designing here or talking about designing here is a mechanism, not just to provide uh, 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 accountability, but also to provide oversight so that the legislature is kept apprised of things that are open, things that are problem areas, things that may blow up at our faces so that we're aware of it, and also provides a mechanism to follow up to the extent that is necessary. Again, with some controls and guidelines to, to do that. So an example of that is um, the auditor finding that our dam, some of our dams might not have been meeting the safety requirements. And so what happens to that report? Who's looking at it? Who's making sure that in a year there's some change, that the funds are there and they're actually being spent inside of government to fix those problems? And then there are also issues uh, that happened in the past that can potentially be embarrassed to people either in the General Assembly or in the administration. And I, I certainly, as a former state auditor, I've seen this many times uh, in which people don't really want to look back at things that will embarrass them. And as a result, they don't often get looked back on to the depth that they should. And this provides a, a, an oversight mechanism to ensure that we do, in fact, look back. Uh, and it provides a level of look back control so that this committee doesn't have the ability to go and create a major investigation of some kind, again, without authority and the permission to do so. But it says the audit, the, this group can look at some things that, that get referred to it, whether through audit or otherwise, and recognize that when we talk about audit, we aren't just talking about audits that are done by the state auditor's office. We have lots of auditors uh, in state government. Uh, provided by agencies, the federal government, for example, uh, who provide audits and provide audit reports. Question is, is there a place that that goes to from a legislative perspective that provides oversight to it? And this provides a mechanism for that to happen also. And so then number three, it builds on that, right, as to where's the staff coming from? And it's to define a policy, planning, and program evaluation staff function to assist the General Assembly with improved accountability. So that's that coming from Joint Fiscal Ledge Council together to help us with that work, both in committee and outside of committee. Papers consumed. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm so making notes. Go ahead. Sorry. It seems like with what Mr. Former Auditor just said <laughs> and the continuation of this that. And it's getting to be a pretty fine line between the administration's responsibility to carry out the will of the legislature and our ability to just say, here's the money, go do what we said. How do you deal with that? I mean, we seem to be enforcing something that we may traditionally not have the authority to do. I think that that fine line is exactly what's here. Don't we do that now? We sort of do this now. We come back in January and we say, oh, how come we didn't spend that money on the housing in Bennington, but we approved it? Mm -hmm. And so there are, and then we receive reports. We might receive a report from the federal government that goes through the auditor's office and ends up in a committee that says um, all kinds of things that we should be doing. I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, the um, Child Care Financial Assistance Program had been told when they were audited that they didn't, um, they, their IT systems were not up to speed. So we um, made sure through the appropriations process that that money kept going, funneling into the Agency of Human Services, Department of Children and Families in order to upgrade that. And it wasn't happening. And we didn't realize truly that they were not in compliance. And so this is an opportunity rather than just as we do now, which is sort of walk on both sides of that line, trying to figure it out, even though we're a part-time legislature, this is an opportunity to really look to have systems in place that make it so that individual legislators don't have to remember it on their own. So the CCFAP plan uh, pro problem that came up, I knew about it. And I don't know if you remember, Representative Treber was the one who had told me in appropriations. And so we, we kept asking those questions, right? But if both of us had left office at the same time, 
the systems that weren't really in place to make sure that people were asking those questions based on these sort of things being in place. And that's what we're really saying, that there is a fine line, but we're trying to figure out how best to follow through without it being about the individual sitting in the arsenal. And it's in most states that you looked at, it is a legislative watchdog as opposed to a separate inspector general sort of uh, organization. That well, the legislature in many of the states that we looked at did have a mechanism, often a legislative audit office, for example, in which the reports by these outside agencies went to one place in the legislature. This is not exclusive, uh, but one of the things that legislatures did is to look at whether or not the legislation they passed was being implemented and the processes they put in place were in fact being followed. Uh, and then it, it gave them the ability to have sufficient information to be able to ask the questions that legislatures typically ask when they talk with agencies uh, or others who are involved with the implementation of programs. It also uh, was designed to help legislatures look at was the, the legislation passed sufficient? Was it working? Was it doing what was intended? And is there something else we should do? It, answer, it helps answer questions, and that's the real goal. It's not designed to replace anybody else. Um, okay, and then the next one is adjust the timing of the programmatic and performance measures budget report, as well as other reports. We just noticed, and this again is something to take testimony on, but we really noticed that the budget really is a, it's one year, right? From, we know there's a beginning and an end, but couldn't, do you have to look at it at the beginning or the end? Could you look at it when it makes sense? So if you always look at it in October, then it's still one year that you're looking at it in October. So that by January, you're prepared and ready to go um, is a question that I think is important for you all to think about, like, why do we stick to certain deadlines when we know how difficult they are to meet for both sides? Um, so that's- well, In particular, you may get a legislative report that is delivered to the General Assembly on January uh, 15th, but uh, in order to prepare a budget to deal with it, you have to have the information well in advance so that the information is useful uh, in the construction of that budget, which is actually gonna be delivered in January. The fact that we have information coming in at various points in time is rather, as rather, some, as rather than having some consistency in having reporting dates that match the actual need for the information. That's the piece that seems to be missing. And what we're saying is perhaps if there is more consistency in this and more thought given to when reports are delivered to us to act on, we might be able to produce better end results. Put it all together. Um, Five is increased consistency and accountability in rulemaking with support from the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. And that's the one that I said, they've already started some of these changes um, that both we recommended and the auditor has recommended. So I think it'll be important for you all to hear from LCAR. Do you have Representative Higley here, who is our uh, ambassador to LCAR and serves on both <laughs> this committee here in LCAR? <laughs> Great. Um, okay, number six, develop processes, checklists, and timelines to ensure all key legislative reports and deadlines are easily accessible to the General Assembly and the public. And that's that once we do have um, work completed that shows how we're doing, that it's actually somewhere on our website accessible to the public, as well as to legislators who maybe didn't sit on that committee or didn't realize that that had happened or they're new and they want to check out how we're doing in different areas. We don't really have that anywhere on our website. It's pretty much dependent on what you know you're going after to look for. But if you're just a member of the public, it's really hard to find information about our accountability. Um, Number seven, seven, establish a process to ensure that committee members and committee staff regularly and formally review past legislation, legislative <clears throat> mandated reports, and other materials. I think we've talked about that a lot. <laughs> Number eight, establish a process that allows House and Senate committees dealing with issues related to appropriations institutions and transportation and the reason for those three committees these are money committees 
to follow up on the previous year's budget with historical data. So the idea being that rather than, for those of you, uh, I'm not sure if this committee does, works on the budget, but most policy committees work on the budget. So our House Human Services Committee, we um, look at the policy decisions that are made or not made um, based on how much money is appropriated, right? So this idea is that we wouldn't right now the way when we look at the budget a lot of it is around the ups and downs but not those things that happen to stay the same it might have been that they went down or up but not by the end of the year they were back on the same line and so we miss a lot of information right overall and then the real question is shouldn't we be looking at three or four years back and see what's happening we do get some information like that when we look closely at the budget um, we see some bar graphs and things like that, but it would be what we'd really like is the big numbers to be over time so that we can actually see how things are changing in government over time. Um, that one's a harder one than I think you'd have to hear from appropriations, but we, we did see some evidence of this in the New Mexico um, bills. It seemed like it was a, a lot of the um, the questions that were posed by staff in the Joint Fiscal Office were around time, over time. They weren't um, very specific to last year and this year, you know, just looking at like the 23 and 24 budget. They were looking back to the 20 budget, that sort of thing. Um, and then number nine, is that right? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Establish a process for committees to monitor and report upon deadlines relevant to enacted legislation. And so that's in our committee, we passed the big child care bill last year. We made sure that our committee assistant had um, has all written down into our timeline when every report is due and if it's not in checking on it, that sort of thing. But really making that a system, something we do in every committee, it's not all the same. The other thing is legislative council does a report at the end of the year that summarizes all of our laws that were signed by the governor and in it they have a chart that shows um, when everything is due to be done from that law but it doesn't just go in a structural way to every committee like legislative council doesn't always come into every committee and explain that it's specific to the bills and the laws that they worked on um, some committee chairs encourage it and go ask for it, others don't. And so, again, back to my point of it shouldn't matter who's sitting in these seats, it should just be a process so that everyone gets used to that happening and um, makes and is able to respond how they would like. So, number 10 is require a performance note for legislation that is a priority or costs more than a threshold dollar amount. This is a big one, and um, one. If, if you look back here into your section by section, if you go to 10, you'll see, my pages aren't numbered, but I bet your pages are. Um, is it for you? No, I don't think your pages are numbered. Well, I have it on the PDF I have, it's page 11. It's... Does it say number 10? At the bottom, I have it at the very bottom. Okay, and then when you go over to A, B, and C, and D, you'll see that this is that if you are doing legislation, that you have a clear statement of legislative intent, the overall goals, and the changes anticipated, a description of expectations and timelines for these expectations, how you're going to collect the data in order to collect, to measure results, and evaluate whether the legislation is having its intended impact including its impact on specific populations, an entity designated by the General Assembly, preferably one that is independent and nonpartisan to be responsible for data collection, monitoring and reporting back to the General Assembly on the progress associated with the policy changes and investments. And it could be this new group of staff that we've been talking about, right? That would help us to walk through this on legislation in the committee room, but then also would help us to look back when we um, get to the next step. We talk a lot, you know, which we do, and I'm sure you all see 
uh, the kind of fiscal notes that Joint Fiscal Prepares for us to give us an idea about costs and estimates. And what this is, 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 is something somewhat similar, a performance note. It tells us if we're going to pass this bill, and this isn't for every bill, this is for key bills or certain bills perhaps that pass the financial threshold. Something that tells us what is it we're trying to achieve. If we did achieve it, what would it look like? How could we measure that achievement and how could we put numbers to it if there is a, an issue of cost or return on investment? And then how do we monitor it? And one of the things, if, if you've been here for a while and you hear a lot of agencies come in to tell you about how they do, they typically don't come in and say, you know, we really messed this up. <laughs> we missed our budget target. We didn't save any money. We added a lot of staff that didn't stay. A lot of things went wrong. That's a, that's a lesson that you rarely hear. Uh, but those, in some cases, are lessons that are real. And that's why we say, ideally, the answers that we get to those questions should be done by someone who has a degree of independence to be able to tell us without necessarily having ownership of the problem. Uh, and there again, uh, there's some suggestions about how to achieve that. And a good example of that is, again, I have to always draw from my committee because that's where my examples are. But the child care bill. We worked really hard to make sure that there was an entity that is going to collect the data to show whether or not this bill is having its intended impact. It was a leadership um, priority last year, so it would fit in this qualification, right? It, it cost money, it was a new tax, I mean, all of those things. And what, so we put, we put Building Bright Futures, that is a quasi public, private, independent group in charge of, they do qualitative and quantitative research with 14 groups from all over the state, um, talking with parents, families, providers, all of it, and really are able to track down and are helping us to come up right now. I think on January 15th, they're gonna be releasing a report to the legislature that shows what they're gonna be tracking, how they're gonna track those things, and they just came into our committee the other day, and already it's only been six months and we've created over 100 new spots in um, child care spots all over Vermont, especially in some of our, re our most rural areas, Newport, St. Johnsbury, all kinds of areas. And we wouldn't have that information if we hadn't built it into the legislation. So it benefits all of us, not just you know, there's, it's a, it makes so much sense to be able to look and say, it worked. This is working after just six months. And they're going to be giving us updates every year for the next 10 years to be able to show. And this will help us tweak the bill if it's not going quite right. If we find a problem, we'll see it. We'll see it in the data. How, how, I can't imagine anything better than that. So I have to say that this number 10 is my, is my favorite. Um, I just have the idea isn't that we would do a performance note if we're doing like some procedural tweak to election policy. This yeah. is when we're creating a revenue source and a big program and we're trying to impact thousands of families on a huge thing like child care, then we want to collect data and we want to understand who it's coming from and who's going to be held accountable, who's collecting it. Exactly. Like housing. Wouldn't it be nice to have all that kind of information on all the things that all the um, what we've done so far in housing, we've put in a huge amount of money, but we don't have a huge amount of information to help us understand it. And I think that that's that's the point. The um, the other thing is some little things we might want to know. Um, some of this data we might want to have. For for example, this tobacco bill won't be a huge cost actually be pretty low because it shouldn't impact taxes too much. We will lose a little maybe, but we do want to know, is it helping us to reduce the number of kids who are using e-cigarettes? And there are many other questions we have too. So there, it's important for everyone, I think, to take some responsibility for looking at what they introduce. And if it were to pass, would they want to be able to tell people in their district or in this state how it has impacted the state. I think, don't we all want that in the long run? And even if it comes out, as Senator Brock said, if it comes out not quite what you had thought, like, oh, there's no new spots being created in childcare. Okay, 
why not? What's going wrong? Are we not paying enough? Are we right? So then we can still make amendments. That's the wonderful part. Or we can sunset a bill and start over. But at least we'll have some data to make our decisions with. And that's really what I believe this is all about. As we look at the tobacco as the classic example, is we want to know what's the effect on the sale of tobacco. We also want to know what's happening in neighboring states, and particularly in those states that abut Vermont and those communities abut Vermont, are their sales rising? Uh, and are the numbers such that you can see that we haven't really made much of a dent at all? I hope that isn't the case, but that is one of the things that we should be looking for. We should be looking for information that helps us validate that what we did was the right thing, or if what we did was not the right thing, is not working, to help us correct the course before we spend large amounts of time and large amounts of money on something that isn't working. And so number 11 is just simply define and right size the overall staffing necessary for the legislative branch to carry out the recommendations of this report. So and it gives you in each one where we should be looking or hearing testimony. It would just help. I, mostly these are written in a way that hopefully will help you all to hear to know where to get your where to hear testimony from in order to be able to make the best decisions you can make for us. The um, and so it goes through each each of the recommendations and where you might want to. I think finally, very very important is the last section that's on recommendations addressing 2023 acts and resolves number 53 section 2A. And these are the questions that you asked us to answer around equity and inclusion and sunsetting. You know, those were the um, well, it says it right here. It gave the Summer Committee on Government Accountability a very broad charge and initially only three meetings. The committee focused its initial meetings on this first charge, which is what we've been talking about, of creating systems within the General Assembly to increase accountability. But the second through the fourth charges focused on composition, appointment, and compensation of boards and commissions and are an entirely separate body of work from the first charge. The committee is grateful for the attention and effort of the Office of Racial Equities Executive Director, Susanna Davis, for bringing these issues to the committee's attention at both its November 3rd and December 13th meetings. But given our limited time, I mean, we, we had four meetings, and as you can see, we did quite a bit in four meetings. Um, we are available to meet these ambitious legislative charges by mandated deadline and the profound importance of these volunteer positions to our state's functioning, the committee recommends the following next steps. And those are for you all. And honestly, if I were you, I'm just, I guess I'm sitting in this chair, so I get to say it one time, which is I would put these in their own bill separate from government accountability, because government accountability is, is something different. And this, it both have equally incredible importance to the way things work but they're different. And so I put them into two, into two bills, if it were me. That's it. <laughs> Questions for our co-chairs, Representative Pango. This is not a question. This is something I've expressed to each of them individually. But I found this to be one of the, the most compelling reports that we've ever been presented with because it really specifies actions that we should take. And I, I feel like it's all really common sense. And um, some of it I don't believe that we really aren't doing, but or aren't doing already, but it's it's understandable when you think about how much turnover there is, both with legislators, with staff, um, and how reports could just get lost, even though they're well intended that people will read them. So I really appreciate the work that you did and can't believe you did it all in four meetings. <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you. Um, I am cognizant that we were referred a bill and I had that uh, on the agenda today, uh, H702. Uh, did I get the number right? <laughs> uh, which I believe, um, the uh, House members of the committee all co-sponsored, and um, it is a short form bill that I think, uh, I know legislative council is not here, but if I'm not mistaken, it just says 
uh, adopt the recommendations that are in the report that we have all talked us through. Um, so I think, you know, for us as the committee, um, I'd like to take the next step and actually start to flush some of this out outside of the bounds of our committee room uh, and honor the work that you all did this summer and try to turn 702 into a vehicle to uh, enact these recommendations. I think the recommendations are clear and I really value all of the work that you put in. I also know that it is going to be uh, a challenge, I think, to get them into legislative language where we can get consensus and actually move it all forward. So we've got some work ahead of us uh, to dive into this, but um, it's one of the things that I think we set, we set you all out some work. You've come back with good specific recommendations and it's our obligation to uh, do our best this year to uh, try to make some progress in these areas. I, I don't know if other folks on the committee, uh, if there's anything you're particularly excited to work on, um, but I'd love to get um, and we don't have to do this right now, but if there are two or three or four of us that want to work on the language um, and consult with Senator Brack and Representative Brumson and say, is this really what you meant by that? Legislative Council and try in the next couple of weeks uh, to get um, 702 kind of flushed out. I would appreciate volunteers to help with that work because it's going to be a lift. <laughs> I'm happy to help too. That's fine. And I, I'm blessed you're going to get time. To, to do that, but I, um, I think the house is going to start, right? Is that correct? What's that? You're going to start the bill here. Yes. And send it over. Yeah, it's our, uh, so um, Senator Hardy and I uh, began a tradition last year and we've both house and Senate gov ops have worked well then on some of these bills that are kind of priorities for both bodies where we kind of know one group is one body's going to start and then the other committee will get to finish. Um, we've been able to sort of divvy up some of that work uh, pretty well. And I, I drew the, taking the first crack at uh, taking your recommendations and uh, getting them through the drafting process. So this will be, uh, I think the house side going first and uh, we'll do our best to give you all something over the Senate, Senator Brock, that you can <laughs> not have to sand down too much. <laughs> I think um, it definitely maybe next, hear from New Mexico. I think you'd be interested in what they did and they might be able to help you with legislative language. Um, and also we had Tim Devlin from Legislative Council. Is that who you'll yes. have? So he, he knows that too. And if you look at our um, web page, you know, when you go to committees and go to other, and then under that summer government accountability committee, um, we have a lot of slide decks from, I think like 12 different states. So you could look at that as well. And if something, you know, the nice part is if you do maybe do small groups working on three or four of them, you know, like separate out the recommendations and have it kind of like what we do on the budget. And um, we do it outside of the committee room and then we bring our um, stuff together and talk about what we found. Then you could look at some of those different states and say, oh, in this area of this state has some good ideas. And oh, in that area of this state. I mean, I've been thinking about this late at night, you know. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so how on earth do you get on top of all that you would have to do? And that's just an idea because you don't have to, I don't think you have as much of a lift during budget sessions. So this might be an opportunity, that would be a good time to do it the way we do it during budget. We still have stuff going on in our committee. We still hear testimony, but we're all off on our own in small groups of two or three doing work to, on a couple of the areas. So you could do it something like that. Just an idea. I appreciate the <laughs> suggestions. It's, uh, there's a lot here. Uh, and I also uh, am glad that there are other states that have gone before that you're saying, yeah, these models look like yeah. you know, to emphasize. Um, I had the opportunity to meet the appropriations chair from uh, New Mexico last summer, and uh, they have a very different style of how they do business in New Mexico, but some really impressive ways of thinking about how to organize their legislative work and um, not surprised that they have a model that we can crib from. Um, What's nice with their legislative council there is the legislative council actually helps them to think of the questions too. Like as they work through a law, a new bill, they'll say, you know, okay, so 
what are the goals here? What is the legislative intent? It, it does make a difference when you're asked those questions. It, makes, it forces everyone at the table to think about it. Any final questions for our co-chairs? Well, thank you very, very much for inviting us. And uh, this is a fun project, but <laughs> critically important. And you know, it really isn't that complicated. Once you sit back and you think about, gee, wouldn't it be nice to know what it is we're trying to achieve in this bill? And wouldn't it be great to really understand, did we do it? That is complicated when you really think about it to its fundamentals. Well, I think what you're suggesting here standardizes the questions and it seeks to create mechanisms where there's a culture of continually coming back to those same questions to check back in and make sure that we're actually doing the things that we set out to do in legislation. Um, and it's, it's that not being uh, victims of the immediacy of whatever the next thing is and the next thing. And, and I think one of the things we also on. talked about was the uh, ability to have some immediacy in our reporting on the one hand, to the extent possible, and second, to have clarity. Um, we, we have this tendency in government, as you know, to produce 450 page reports <laughs> that no one reads. Uh, but really understanding whether something works and whether or not something does what's intended can often be expressed pretty simply. And the key to people understanding, reading and appreciating it was the ability to express it simply. And that sometimes is hard to do without thought. Um, you are reminding me, Senator Brack, that um, Tucker Anderson uh, of Legislative Council has compiled uh, the list of reports that are up for uh, a repeals review, uh, and that those uh, we haven't done that whole process in a few years, so it's a little backed up. I believe there are 140 candidate reports um, that uh, the chairs of the relevant committees of jurisdictions have all received a very organized spreadsheet uh, description of those reports and uh, been asked to give way in with their committees and give feedback to us to com uh, compile a list of reports that may be ready to go off into the sunset. So <laughs> um, I think the, the timing is good and there's a little bit of a parallel there. So we're, we're going to try to be a, about efficiency and accountability and just doing a little bit of government house cleaning this year <laughs> in a way that maybe we don't always take a step back and do so. Um, this is the, the year for that here in GovOps. So I appreciate you uh, doing all of this work with us and we will definitely be contacting both of you for help and, and guidance Great. as we try and get into the drafting process on this. So. Great. Um, well, committee, we um, will be back here um, at nine tomorrow, and uh, we'll let our co-chairs go. I don't think there's anything. Um, yeah, I think we're picking up our um, harder work, but I don't think there's any big announcements or anything that I need to make. So I will wish you all a good evening.